prosecutor, would you say it is an, a, it appears, you know, it's an appearance issue, or how would you approach looking at the Trump administration and corruption issues? Well, the hotel thing doesn't really bother me. Um, it, it was a pre-existing hotel. This is what we got when we elected someone who was a businessman who had really broad business interests. And, and even if the president were no longer profiting directly from the revenues from his hotels, his golf courses, and all the rest of it, his family would be, because it's a family-owned business and not a public company. And I don't think it would be fair to make the entire family divest everything they have, um, because what they could sell it for, knowing they had to sell it, would be a fraction of what it was really worth. So I don't think that the president's family should be penalized for the fact that the American people elected him. Um, I think they all have to be, everybody in the family needs to be careful and conscious of what they do. I think Ivanka has now ended her clothing line and a couple of other things. And that those kind of things make sense. You know, don't put yourself in a position where people are going to be questioning you that much. That wasn't a core part of the Trump business anyway, let's face it. That the core part of the businesses are the hotels, the office buildings, and the, and the golf courses. And they should be allowed, I think, to, to run their core businesses. Um, but listen, there's no question that prosecutors are going to be watching public officials all the time. It's part of our system, part of the way it should be. And if there's something that needs to be handled, it'll be handled. Um, and I have confidence in that. I mean, listen, the Justice Department's in a little bit of a, you know, uh, the best way to put it. Um, you know, I think, I think a little bit of turmoil right now. Um, but that doesn't affect the U.S. attorneys. I can tell you as a U.S. attorney, if there was fighting going on down in Washington, it was just another excuse to stay out of Washington, you know, and stay as far away as possible. I have Mike Chertoff, who, who you all may remember as the Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, he was my boss at the Justice Department when I was U.S. attorney. He was head of criminal division. And he used to, but he was also happy the U.S. attorney in New Jersey before me. And he said, you know, the great thing about being a U.S. attorney is it's like being the captain of a ship that's out at sea. And the Justice Department is the base. And sometimes you hear the radio and sometimes you don't. Um, and, and, and so I think most U.S. attorneys won't let what's happening in Washington bother all that much. They know what they need to do. The men and women that do that job are uh, in the main. I think the president has picked some good people and they're going to do well. Well, so do you think that when the Russian investigation is concluded, should the investigation findings be disclosed to Congress? Well, you know, it's interesting because the, the law is different now, as you know. Uh, the law used to be that everything had to be disclosed to Congress, and then the law changed um, after the Clinton investigations into Whitewater. Um, Congress killed that law and now has it that the report goes to the Attorney General, and then the Attorney General decides what should be revealed publicly or not. I think in today's world it's impossible to believe that Robert Mueller's report will become public. Whether it's supposed to be or it isn't, right? It's going to become public, right? People will either leak it or the Attorney General, whoever it is at that time, will decide to release it. Um, one or the other, or both. Um, so, um, but, but I'd say a few things. I, I have um, a similar opinion to the President. I'm one of those folks and a different opinion as the other. So now I worked with Jim Comey. Jim Comey was the U.S. Attorney in Manhattan when I was the U.S. Attorney in New Jersey. And then Jim got promoted to Deputy Attorney General, which made him my boss. Uh, the Jim Comey that I knew back then is significantly different than the James Comey who became director of the FBI. And the things that he did, quite frankly, when he was director of the FBI to Hillary Clinton were unthinkable. Unthinkable. Unthinkable that you would come out and have a press conference as FBI director and say, we're not charging her, but let me tell you a whole bunch of really awful things about it. That's not what we're supposed to do as prosecutors. We're either supposed to charge or shut up. If you've got enough evidence to charge somebody, let them have it. And if you don't, then keep quiet. It's un it was totally unfair to her. And what it did was, what it did was, it forced him to then do the letter he did in October. Now, there's a rule in the Justice Department that we all know that within 60 days of an election, you do nothing. Because we don't want prosecutors to be affecting elections. Because we hold a special place in the public's mind. And if we come out and do something or say something, the public goes, well, wait a second. You know, we should listen to this because the prosecutors are doing it. When he did that at the end of October, the only reason he had to do it was the bad decision he made back in July. If he had kept his mouth shut back then, 
you would have had no reason to say anything else in October. Now, all those things benefited the candidate I was supporting, but it still made me sick to my stomach because prosecutors shouldn't be doing those things. And by the way, last point, Jim wasn't a prosecutor anymore, but he was acting like one. He was the investigator. Investigators don't decide whether to prosecute someone or not. Prosecutors do. And when I was a U.S. attorney, if the head of the FBI in New York had a press conference like Jim had, I would have him fired. And Jim should have been fired. I don't think the president should have ever kept him. I advised the president of that during the transition. I said, if you're going to fire Jim Comey, fire him now. Don't let him start serving. Your administration, I'm sure the president wishes he would have followed that advice. Would have saved himself a lot of, a lot of hassle. And I said, I'm not going to tell you. I said, but what I will tell you is, Marco Rubio's campaign ends tonight. And she just looked at me and she said, yes, sir. And I went on the stage and we did. We ended Rubio's campaign that night. And I, and I had hoped that by ending his campaign, his supporters would come to me. What ultimately happened was, what we saw in the post-election polling was, that me, Jeb, and Kasich pretty much divided up the Rubio, the amount that Rubio lost evenly. So that, you know, I didn't get the benefit out of it that I thought I would. But I do think that our party in the country got a benefit out of it. Because I do think that Hillary Clinton would have beaten Marco Rubio. Um, and, and I think we would be in the middle of a Hillary Clinton presidency now. So, you know, that would have been something that I would have been, you know, too in favor of. So. I could just sit and talk campaign drama the entire <laughs> rest of the time, uh, but I guess I'll ask one more question, then we'll open it up. But in New Hampshire, I think you, you opened your campaign, or you made a major policy address about American exceptionalism. And you talked about the need for the United States to have principles that we stand for and that the world knows what we stand for. Would you say that Donald Trump, that his foreign pol policy embodies American exceptionalism, or how would you define his foreign policy today? Well, it, it does. It's just a different type of American exceptionalism than the one I was talking about. You know, Donald's view, I believe, the president's view, of, of the way that should be expressed is through our economic strength almost exclusively, and our military strength. Um, he talks about the fact that he can push on these trade deals the way he's pushing. Listen, he's been successful. We got a better deal with Mexico now, better deal with Canada now, better deal with South Korea now. And I'm willing to bet anybody in the room, whatever you got in your pocket, that we'll have a better deal with the EU and ultimately a better deal with China by the time he's done. Um, he believes that our exceptionalism is expressed through our economic strength and our military strength. I believe that the third element of that is also our moral strength. And I don't think the president talks about that as much as he should. Um, but I, I think that he is showing people around the world that America is going to stand for certain things, and one of those things is true free markets. He believes that if Americans are allowed to compete on an even playing field with anyone, that we'll win. And I think he's right. And what he has said is that it's not been fair. Trade has not been fair. He's right. Over the course of the last 30 or 40 years, at least. And so he's made that, at least, the place where he's decided to make his stand on American exceptionalism. He, and almost exclusively, he said, this is where we're going to define it. We're going to define it as we are exceptional economic actors. We have better work ethic. We have better ingenuity than any other country in the world. And if I can level the playing field, the American economy will soar. And let's face it, everybody, we're looking at unemployment below 4%. We're looking at some really good results in the stock market and in other indicators. Um, and now he's going to have to work out trying to deal with this deficit, which I think is going to be a long, is a long-term problem for us and one that he's going to have to start to grapple with because we can't run debt going forward because interest rates are starting to go back up. It's going to cost us more and more to service this debt. We've had pretty much free money since 2008 and the economic crisis. And the Fed is starting to raise interest rates. And we're going to have to get smart about the fact that when you're paying like half of 1% on, you know, a couple of trillion dollars, when that goes to 2 or 2.5%, two that's a lot of money. And so that's his next big challenge. But I think he's decided to stake his presidency from a global perspective on this trade issue. And I think so far he's been successful. We'll see if he continues to be. If he does, it's going to help us economically, even if it's going to be 
short-term pain. 